This morning's Gospel lesson is the familiar passage from the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, commonly known as the Beatitudes. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. But so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. When we consider these well-known words, they will at first more than likely seem comforting. We focus on the idea of blessing, and it is easy to miss just what it is that Jesus is telling his followers is blessed. Consider, blessed are the poor, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the hungry and the thirsty, finally concluding with, blessed are you, when you are persecuted and falsely accused. Perhaps we think we can make some sense of it when we try to decipher the word blessed. There must be some profound spiritual meaning to these states of being that Jesus is describing, and we philosophize and religiousize the words until they again become soothing, churchly sounds. Well, we can do that until we look at it a little more closely, and we realize that the word we translate as blessed or blessed is in fact the Greek makarios, which simply means happy in a very ordinary sense. So then, happy are you when you are reviled and persecuted, and we begin to wonder what it is that Jesus is really talking about. At the very least, we may recognize that the economy of God's kingdom exists in diametric opposition to that of the world in which we live. The very characteristics and states of being that Jesus attests should make us happy are the things that our society maybe all significant human societies, would have us believe are the things to avoid, the very things that diminish us. For example, who would want to be meek? Happy are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What could be farther from the truth? Who is it that gets ahead in this world, in this earth? Who is it that makes the big money, holds the positions of power, receives the accolades and adulation of society? Is it the meek? Of course not. Rather, it's the go-getters, the ones who speak up for themselves and go after what they want, the ones who make their presence known in the world. Happy are the peacemakers. Really? Once again, the world would tell us the opposite. Happy are you when you win. Happy are you when you put one over on your enemies. In a culture that increasingly looks to military solutions to problems, peacemakers are often seen as weak and ineffectual, and frankly are as likely as not to come up dead. Clearly, the worldview that Jesus was describing was very different than the one his disciples were accustomed to, 
and just about the complete opposite of what we, in much of Western culture, understand. For this morning, I'd like to take a look at just the first of these so-called Beatitudes. Happy, then, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is often taken to mean that you must be this thing called poor in spirit in order to guarantee your entrance into heaven. And, of course, there has been more than a little scholarly debate over what poor in spirit actually means. I've heard it said that one must be humble to get into heaven. That's what poor in spirit must mean, to be humble. Or perhaps it means not being too attached to worldly wealth. That could be it. Now, while those that I just mentioned are probably good qualities, I'd like to suggest the phrase poor in spirit isn't exactly either of those things. And while I'm attempting to debunk linguistic myths, I'd also like to suggest that the kingdom Jesus is talking about is not what we usually think of as heaven. Jesus is not speaking about some nether realm where the souls of good people go after death. For such a concept would have been completely alien to his hearers. Heaven as a repository for the souls of the faithful doesn't really enter into Christian thinking until much later, and was certainly no part of first century Jewish thinking. But Jesus is saying, you will enter into the kingdom of the skies, the heavens, God's kingdom, if you have this particular quality, to be poor in spirit. I mentioned that scholars have debated the meaning of this for many years, but there is one thing they cannot get around, one thing that cannot be given a veneer of acceptability, the word poor. Tokos in Greek is actually even stronger than we might imagine. It means reduced to abject poverty, to a state of complete nothingness, needing to beg in order to survive. So happy are you when your spirit is such that you have nothing, when you are totally bereft of any substance at all. Once again, our society doesn't think all that highly of poverty of any sort as a goal. No parent would say to his child, Son, I want you to grow up and be nice and poor. No one says, I hope to do poorly on this exam, or I'm planning on doing a really poor job at work today. The poor is lacking. Poor means we come up short, and we don't understand at all how it is supposed to make us happy. To cast some light on this seeming paradox, I look to a well-known biblical character, one described for all his shortcomings as a man after God's own heart. That would be King David. Now, at first blush, if ever there was a man blessed by not being poor, it was David. Sure, he came out of relatively modest beginnings, but Right from the onset, he wasn't lacking. Apparently, he wasn't lacking in good looks, and he had significant skill and athletic ability, not the least of which he was apparently great with a slingshot. He had at least one friend who was closer than a brother to him, and he was chosen to be king even though he was not in direct line to ascend the throne. As king, his riches and power were considerable. He had immense military victories and splendid cities and dwellings. And then things change. The passage from 2 Samuel 11, 1 begins, in the springtime, when kings go off to war. It's really rather poetic, isn't it? More than a few composers, including myself, by the way, have used that verse as a springboard for a composition. 
Of course, as a pacifist, I will confess that I somewhat resent the line, as if it is telling us that this is a normal thing. It's springtime, so let's go make war. Football season is over, and baseball season hasn't started, but it's okay because now it's war season. Well, at least according to our text, David's downfall seems to be in that very springtime when kings go off to war. David himself, it seems, did not go personally. Uh, perhaps he was tired of war. Who could blame him? He'd had enough of it, and he was probably about 50 when all of this takes place. So he sent his generals and his men and stayed behind. And of course, we know the rest. He spied a beautiful woman, and even after discovering that she was the wife of one of his own military men, he determined he had to have her. Well, a king usually gets what he wants. He was rich, after all, and riches tend to get us what we want. Nature takes its course. The woman, Bathsheba, becomes pregnant. David tries to cover up what will surely be a most shameful scandal, first by trying to arrange a situation where Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, will believe the child is his. And when that didn't work, he arranged to kill, legally, but most unfairly, the husband Uriah. Well, in life, as I suppose we all know, deep in our hearts, surely I know it, and I suspect you may as well, we might lie to the whole world. And frankly, in a way, we are taught to do so at an early age. But there are two people we cannot lie to. We cannot lie to ourselves. Not really. Not ever completely. And it seems we cannot lie to God. So Second Samuel chapter 12 tells us that God was displeased with David's actions. So God, the story goes, sends the prophet Nathan as an instrument of correction. Listen now to one of Scripture's most heartbreaking passages, verses 1 through 7 of 2 Samuel 12. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich, the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he brought it up. It grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. and He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. You are the man. And in that instant, David went from being well-nigh the richest man in the world to the poorest. Not because he lost wealth or power, or even at that moment his reputation, although I suppose all of that might have happened. Rather, he became poor, poor in spirit, for he completely lost his right to brag his right to judge others as he had done even in the midst of Nathan's parable. He was rapidly reduced to being a spiritual beggar. So maybe now we have a clear picture of what it is to be spiritually poor. But why and how should this ever make us happy? The answer, I believe, is as follows. When we perceive ourselves as rich, we are not inclined to seek very much more. Or even better, put it this way, 
When we think we are full to the brim and overflowing, we will never hunger and thirst for anything. But if we recognize our poverty, our abject need, then and only then can we desire to be filled with something unimaginably better. When David was not just on top of his palace looking to the neighbor's yard, but on top of his world, rich, successful, and powerful, the Lord of all he surveyed, he had little need for God's all-encompassing love. And so he very clearly didn't have a whole lot of it in his heart. He lacked in that God-given compassion, lacked in good sense, lacked morally in so many ways, though he was unspeakably rich. But when his spirit became poor, or more likely, I should say, when he realized the level of poverty in which his spirit dwelled, he realized his need for forgiveness and perhaps, just maybe, recognized his solidarity with others who were also poor and in need of forgiveness. These words from Psalm 51 are attributed to David, written, we are told, after his encounter with Nathan. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. And later in the psalm, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. And so we too, as we recognize our blood guiltiness, our hand in this world's schemes, the ways in which we have contributed to the anger and the violence, when we realize we stand before God, reduced in every way to the state of a beggar, then we may also understand God's great love, a love that will never cast us away, a love that will never let us go, but rather a love that teaches us to be happy in our calling to serve, to rejoice, as it were, with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn, to be happy as we search for the ways of righteousness, justice, which is in fact mercy. Happy then shall we be as instruments of peace, endeavoring to break the cycles of violence, happy perhaps even to suffer persecution, if it in the end brings about God's kingdom on earth. But the very first part, we must first recognize where we stand, open ourselves up to being filled by the Holy Spirit, that Spirit of Jesus. For as beggars, there is no place to go but up. <laughs>